Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us here tonight. Uh, my name is Pete Everly with the Colorado Renewable Energy Society. And for those of you who are new to our events, uh, CRESS and our local chapters provide education, policy advocacy, and community engagement that accelerate Colorado towards a carbon neutral future powered by 100% renewable energy. Founded in 1996, CRESS is a statewide nonpartisan 503 not for profit that is supported by our sustaining individual and business members as well as donations. Um, you can sign up for our newsletter, social media links, uh, become a member or a donor at www.cres-energy.org. Um, also make sure to visit our YouTube channel, which has over 200 previously recorded uh, presentations such as this, uh, when we're pushing about 2.4 million views on that. Um, you can also register for our newsletter uh, or for our meetup announcements. We also use meetup for that um, and view events also at www.crest-energy.org. Um, before we get started, I want to give a quick uh, thank you to our gigawatt and megawatt business sponsors. That include Moss Adams, Poudre Valley Rural Electric Association, Sinton Instruments, Solaris Energy, Kelly Government Solutions, and Platte River Power Authority. Um, for our upcoming events that we have currently scheduled, uh, this Thursday on the 24th, uh, we have th Certified Gas, Promise, and Perils, featuring Ben Webster, Director of Policy at MIQ Methane Intelligence, uh, which is a not-for-profit climate tech foundation. Uh, so without further ado, um, I'll hand it over to Sophie Meyer of Forum Energy to talk about their wonderful long duration battery technology. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate the time today uh, and the opportunity to, to talk about Form Energy. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Sophie Meyer and I'm a policy advisor for the US West for Form Energy, which means that I cover regulatory affairs, advocacy, and uh, government affairs for, for the whole US West. Plenty to do and really excited to be getting more involved in Colorado. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with FORM, we are building a 100-hour iron air battery uh, to address grid scale needs. So diving in, um, FORM Energy was really founded on the goal of addressing grid needs. Um, we have grown since I joined from 80 people to now over 500 employees with four locations in the US. We're headquartered outside of Boston and Massachusetts. Um, I work out of our Bay Area offices in California. We also have facilities in uh, just outside of Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania. And then we're really excited to be launching our first commercial factory, uh, which we have started building in Weirton, West Virginia. Um, we're also really lucky to have uh, energy storage veterans who founded and are leading our team um, from a number of well-known energy storage companies and to have long-term impact focused investors who are really behind our mission um, and willing to, to support us as we achieve that, even though building hardware is uh, expensive and takes a long time. So in terms of the mission that Forum was founded to address, um, as we see it, there are a number of challenges that we see uh, in the evolving grid. Um, the first and foremost is that we need to really evolve the grid to address the uh, challenges uh, of climate change um, and to decarbonize the grid. Um, so the variability of increasing levels of renewability of renewable energy uh, obviously puts strain on the grid and uh, periods of low renewable generation can pose a risk to grid reliability. We also see retiring firm fossil capacity which increases uh, the grid strain, and then demand strikes, demand spikes, excuse me, from extreme weather events often coincide with low renewable generation and can pose significant reliability risks. And that's something that we see across the country. Um, here I have an example from California, um, which shows a multi-day low renewable generation event. In this case, the supply from renewables uh, is seen to be low over a number of days. Um, and that's the kind of uh, reliability event that our shorter duration storage assets just aren't really equipped to manage. Um, and, you know, we can see that we, we see these kinds of events in Pacific Northwest, California, Texas, Upper Midwest, um, across the country, including in Colorado, though I of course we don't have a specific example here. 
So in, ter in terms of how to really address that while allowing for deep decarbonization, um, we, we looked at the, the cost space that would be necessary to start reliably um, and affordably displacing natural gas um, and really filling in that, that market space. Uh, and we were looking at this sort of $10 per kilowatt hour uh, or $20 per kilowatt hour as the sweet spot for that. And in terms of a dollars per kilowatt hour uh, cost point, lithium ion, we just don't see getting there just based on the entitlement cost alone. Um, this is you know, a graph that's intended to sort of place form inside or amongst all of the other long duration. Um, and as we as we looked at various options as a company, um, we determined that iron air is really the only technology and the only rechargeable battery chemistry that has a low enough entitlement cost to reach that um, that low cost point necessary without the geographical constraints that you see, for instance, with green hydrogen geological storage. So when the company was founded, uh, the the scientists and engineers on our team looked at all of the potential chemistries and determined that iron air was the most appropriate to meet grid needs, both because it helps us achieve that 100 hour battery uh, discharge point. I um, mean, that's 100 hours at full rated. So it's not just that we're triple discharging, mean, that's actually the full system rating for that 100 hours. Um, and it achieves it at the lowest cost. Um, so obviously, iron is very available. Um, and the fact counter electrode is air, um, we call it an air breathing battery, means that we can really bring those costs down and also scale very rapidly because we're not using any materials that have severe supply chain constraints. Uh, it's also a very safe chemistry uh, with a non-flammable aqueous electrolyte and no thermal runaway mechanism like you might see in lithium ion batteries. Uh, and it's very durable, which is important to meet grid needs. So speaking to the system as a whole, um, we have our cell, uh, and that's the chemistry, the, the iron air chemistry that we see. And upon uh, discharge, when we're giving power to the grid, we're actually rusting the iron cell. Um, you can actually see, if you uh, watch it over the days of its discharge, it uh, turn red as the iron in the cell rusts. Um, and then we are reversing that reaction on charge. So that's all happening at the cell level. Uh, the battery module level includes about 50 cells and it's the size of a, of a small car. We have a number of those modules on cycle in our Berkeley labs and it's, it's very exciting to be able to actually see that happening. Um, there are the enclosure level system uh, is our sort of uh, DC building block. We have our, our systems that uh, the, uh, the modular the modular auxiliary systems, excuse me, um, in that enclosure. So that's things like airflow management, um, electrolyte refill. We actually have some of the liquid from the electrolyte evaporate because this is an air breathing battery. So we have to refill with water throughout the operation. Um, and then we include about 50 to 100 enclosures in our power block, which is our smallest AC building block. Um, and that's all connected to a uh, standard utility style burr. Um, and then we can include a number of those power blocks. It's designed to be modular, but our commercial intent system is really in that 10 to 100 megawatt range. So we're really looking at utility scale uh, storage deployment in this case. So this is a very different battery from lithium ion batteries, which I think folks are much more familiar with. Um, so in order to, to show customers, to show regulators how this battery actually can operate and support grid needs, um, we've done a ton of modeling with our formware software that is a, a form proprietary capacity expansion modeling software uh, to show how to best dispatch this battery in a utility portfolio. Um, so the kinds of behaviors that you see from our battery as it supports grid needs are that kind of deep discharge. So you can imagine um, there's four days without wind and our battery discharges from a full state of charge to a zero state of charge to meet grid needs uh, during that time period. We also see some daily cycling to balance out solar. Um, and that looks like, you know, discharging at night and charging during the day. Um, and then additionally, our battery shows a, 
a sort of seasonal shifting behavior. So it can still cycle on a daily basis, but you see in the blue in the middle, it's cycling on a daily basis, but it's actually charging more than it's discharging during spring months when there is excess uh, energy available in the system. And then doing the opposite, discharging more than it's charging during the summer to uh, help meet some of those summer peak needs. So those sorts of behaviors um, allow our battery to provide affordable, clean, firm capacity by pairing with renewables, um, such that you can rely on renewables and clean energy to be available year round. Um, it can provide reliability during extreme weather events. Um, and by doing both of those things, it can accelerate carbon reductions by increasing renewable energy penetration. Um, Additionally, because it allows for better utilization of renewable energy, um, we're actually reducing curtailment, which means that we don't need to build quite as much of the renewable energy generation, which reduces the cost of those emissions reductions and saves money for the ratepayer. Um, and then finally, you know, I, I noted earlier that we don't have any geographical constraints, which means that our battery can be sited where it's needed to reduce transmission congestion and meet grid needs. So in terms of where we are commercially, um, we're working with Great River Energy, a co-op in Minnesota, to deploy our first commercial intent project. Um, so it's sort of a demo project. It's small for us at 1.5 megawatts. Um, and that's something we're going to be deploying next year in 2024. Um, we've also announced a partnership with Georgia Power, looking at deploying a 15 megawatt project for them. Um, and additionally, we've partnered with Xcel Energy and recently announced two projects, um, one that will be in Minnesota and another in Colorado. Um, and I'll speak a little bit more to that on the next slide. But since I provided these slides, we actually were able to announce that we'll be doing a project in New York as well, another 10 megawatt project um, funded by NYSERDA and the state of New York. So that is a very exciting and recent announcement for us. Um, speaking more to the Excel project, um, that's going to be located in Pueblo, Colorado, and that's a 10 megawatt, 1000 megawatt hour system located at the Comanche Generating Station. Um, and we're looking hopefully to bring that online as soon as 2025, um, though it is still subject to regulatory approval. So obviously we are we're hoping to move forward with that quickly. Um, and really, when we think about uh, why, why Pueblo, why this project for Excel, um, it's able to firm the renewable generation in Excel's portfolio and provide firm power through all weather conditions. Um, it allows Excel to integrate more renewable energy and especially wind. Um, and it allows us to demonstrate our technology and help Excel gain familiarity with our technology um, to hopefully lead to larger projects in the future. Um, and as we think about our scale up, you know, we, we have a really aggressive scale pathway. Basically, we built our first uh, iron anode in 2018. Um, you know, we have rapidly scaled that into our full size modules that we're now cycling in Berkeley. We're building out our pilot manufacturing lines in Pennsylvania. And then we just broke ground on our first commercial scale manufacturing factory in West Virginia. Um, and that is uh, looking at local investment to the tune of $760 million, um, a minimum of 750 full-time jobs in West Virginia, um, and uh, really scaling up that manufacturing to start providing cells that we can uh, install, for instance, for that Great River Energy Project in Minnesota um, by 2024. Um, so we only broke ground a couple of months ago, but we already have steel in the air and are really excited to start uh, having those commercial intent cells come off of the line to actually install for utility customers as well as other customers. And that will support this kind of uh, scale up of our company. Uh, as I noted, we're doing one to five megawatt scale projects in 2024, uh, then looking at scaling up to our 10 to 50 megawatt scale projects, 2025, 2026 and then full-scale installations in 2027, 2028, with the intention of deploying gigawatts by the end of the decade. Um, so obviously that is a very ambitious uh, manufacturing scale and commercial scale, but we feel like that's really what's necessary to meet the decarbonization goals while uh, retaining reliability and affordability um, across the US and then you know, with the hopes of expanding beyond the US as well.